this one. This one. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming. Boy, what a treat this is for me. And thanks to Diane for creating this unbelievable gathering of, of fellow tribesmen. 17 years ago? 18 years ago. Something like that. So. So it's a little unusual for me to be here. There's people here in this room that have known me since I was born. And the reason for that is, is because I was born not far from this location, just a few hundred yards towards St. Francis. Okay? And, uh, you know, for me, when I started to think about, you know, what do I say about Chicago? I grew up here. I grew up in Northbrook. As many people call it, John Hughesville. Um, I actually dated his sister-in-law at one point when I was in high school. And I also, not far from here, I went to visit him when he was making a movie, 16 Candles. And uh, we stopped in to say hi and make that connection, you know, between us. Um, but I mention him because you know, unfortunately, John passed away not too long ago. And if anybody's ever seen his tombstone, has anyone gone past? Well, he's buried up in Lake Forest. And he's got the most magnificent piece of Italian marble with his name on it. And I was, you know, thinking about cemeteries. I know it's a little unusual, but because of this research, now when I go into a cemetery, I no longer think of it as a place where ghosts might be flying around. I think of it as a place where we remember the people who are on the planet. We make a connection with them. So the, t the title of tonight's talk is Sacred Heart. And just recently, I stopped by the Sacred Heart Cemetery, which is in Northbrook. And it's where my parents are. And I stopped by to say hi and, you know, weed a little bit. And I also have a close friend who had passed away just a few months ago. Um, his name is Billy Meyer, and I couldn't make it back for his funeral. So I kind of wandered around looking to see if I could find Billy. Where is he? And um, I found his parents, but no Billy. Well, what do you do? You pick up your cell phone, and you call a friend, and you say, where's Billy? You know, is Billy buried here? Where is he? And this friend said, you know, I think, you know, we bought the tomb marker, and I don't know if it's in yet, so I went over to a digger, and I said, do you know this guy? And he said, yeah, we put him in yesterday. <laughs> so I went over and said hello to Billy. And I sat down and, and I was just sitting there sort of listening to the birds chirp and thinking about, you know, what I was going to talk about here. Talk about the flip side and talk about the afterlife and talk about our journey through this life and my journey to this work. And a woman pulled up in her car and I saw her get out and attend to a couple of tombstones, and you know, we said hello, and I said, um, what's your name? And it turns out, the mother of two of my friends. And in her journey, she had, her first husband had died, and then she married into another friend of mine's family. And then we just started talking about the journey of souls. I said, it's funny, I'm here to talk about this stuff. And she went, what is it? <laughs> and I said, really, you wanna talk about this here? She said, yes, I do, please. So an hour and a half later, you know, we had this incredible talk about the flip side and the journey of souls. So that's kind of my topic today because sacred heart, think about what a sacred heart is for a second. You know, those of us raised Catholic, you would see this picture of Jesus and it was a really strange photograph because there was a heart right in front of him, you know, as if it was outside of his chest. What the heck? And I was talking to Diane about her own experience. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but at some point when she had this apotheosis of an experience of connecting to the other side, she said she felt her heart expand in this great sort of graphic way where it felt like it was huge. So now you think about that for a second. I don't know if you're aware of this, but from a science point of view, the heart is the organ in the body that has the most electrical energy. So when they're looking from outer space, or you know, NSA is watching us from satellites, and they see us walking around, and they see those little heats, that's the heart you're seeing. It's not the brain. 
Because the brain, of course, has its own energetic pattern. It's just not as big as the heart. And they've measured the heart that it that the throw of the heart is up to eight feet in some cases. They can actually measure it. Hmm, that's interesting. We've all had that experience of meeting someone for the first time and feeling like we've known them forever. So just on a fundamental level, things that we experience we may not be able to see. That doesn't mean they're not there. Carl Sagan was the great scientist who said, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. <laughs> so when you think about these things and the stuff I'm going to tell you today in my journey to here, when I talk about stuff that doesn't seem possible, as you know, because you've been here and you've heard it before, yes, it's all possible. So my journey comes from the heart as well. I uh, had a very close friend who was passing away. She was very ill. She had cancer. We've been together about 20 years. Luana Andrews is her name. She's an actress. And I had these profound experiences the night before she passed where she came to visit me in the form of a dream. That's what it felt like. But she took me to this kind of experience she was going through, which felt like she was going through a tunnel or a volcano, and I could feel, I could see these sort of red walls around me. And at some point, I heard her say behind my head, isn't this fucking amazing? <laughs> now, she never used the F-bomb, but I recognized her voice clearly, and, but it was her voice about, about age 20, 21, something like that. So, I, but I knew it was Luan, I knew it was her, but it was just, I had met her when she was 30. So, that was unusual. The next morning I woke up and said, I called the, hot, the people who were taking care of her and said, did she pass last night? Because, you know, I had this experience. They said, no, she's still here. So I went over and sat with her. And I asked her at some point, where do you want me to take your ashes? Which is that question we don't really get to ask loved ones. Mm. But I asked it. And she said, Everywhere you go. <laughs> so since that day, I have been taking her ashes with me. She's in the river behind the Dalai Lama's house. She's in the fountain in front of the Taj Mahal. She's in front of the Vatican. In that fountain. She's in the Seine. She's in the Moscow River. She's in New Delhi. She's all over the planet. I mean, I just, for some reason, after she passed, I was everywhere. And I would take a little time to scatter her ashes and say a prayer on her behalf. But she gave me a gift that has led to me being here today. And it was a simple sentence. She turned to me at one point just before she passed and said, I have this recurring dream that I'm in another universe. And I'm in a classroom and everyone's dressed in white. And they're talking about something, uh, they're speaking a language I've never heard before, but somehow I completely understand. My conscious, skeptical mind thought, oh, well, that's the morphine drip. And that must be a hallucination she has. Um, but I noted it. And then the day she died, a friend of hers called me up and said, Oh, I had the most amazing dream about Luana last night. She was in the fourth dimension, she said, in a classroom where everyone was dressed in white. Classroom. I'd never heard of such a thing before. And I mentioned it to the nurse who was taking care of her, and she nearly fainted and said, That was her recurring dream, being in a classroom somewhere else. Okay. Filed it away like we do when you have a weird experience, just, okay, there's classrooms in the afterlife. That's interesting. And at some point, I started working on the Charles Grodin Show in New York, a mutual friend. And so we, he had me sort of working there, and, and I had met Robert Thurman, Uma's dad, who used to be a Tibetan monk, and he was teaching Tibetan philosophy. We became friends. But one day I was meditating on Luana, and I said, you know, if these experiences happen where she came and spoke behind my head, even though she was alive, 
That must mean, therefore, that she exists outside of herself on some level. Just my little question. If that's true, then where are you? So it was a fall afternoon, about four o'clock, kind of tired, long day, laid down in my bed. Has anyone had an out-of-body experience? Wow, a lot of people, okay. So you know what I'm talking about. That familiar buzzing sensation, and like the experiences that I had, I've had in my life, you know, buzzing around the room. Not such a big deal that I would ever even mention it to anybody, you know, other than to say, yeah, I know what that's about. But in this case, I shot into deep space. I saw Manhattan disappear below me, like that movie Power of Ten, you know, whoa, and then shooting into deep space. And Diane, we were talking about this. You had that experience flying as well, but I did, and I was facing forward, and what I saw were like the stars melting around me. It was going so fast, almost like a Star Trek episode. And then at some point, I had the experience of taking a sharp turn. I don't know what that means, but I took a turn, and it felt like I was going through a wormhole. And if you ever saw the movie Contact, it was identical to that. I mean, the movie came out after my experience, but that's what it was like. She kind of went in through a wormhole. And then I came out on the other side, and now I was traveling. Instead of this direction, I was traveling in this direction. I, I don't know what it means. I'm just That was my experience. And I stopped, and there she was, standing in front of me. She had her eyes closed, and she opened them, as if to say, you were looking for me. Here's where I am. And at that moment, some knucklehead outside my window honked his truck horn. You know, like a massive truck. But what was interesting was that I had the reverse experience, like a rubber band pulling me back where I, before the guy took his hand off the horn, I came back that journey, Ugh, wherever that is. I saw Manhattan coming up like a million miles an hour, and then, boom, I was awake. Okay. Now, if she, and let, now let's imagine that the construct is very simple, like either it was real or it wasn't. And so we can dismiss it if it's not real. Great, we can go on with our lives and go back to our cappuccino. If it was real, what's happening? And I thought, if she can pull me to where she is, how can I go find her? So that began this journey 17 years ago. I went to Tibet with Robert Thurman. I shot a film with him. It's available online. You can watch it. We traveled around Mount Kailash. I studied Tibetan philosophy because it seemed to make a lot of sense. However, for those of you who are familiar with Buddhist Philosophy, they don't really believe that between lives you're like a wisp of smoke and based on the actions of your previous lifetime, the karma, that dictates who you're going to be. You know, a lesser, what they call it, a lesser rebirth. Okay? And Robert Thurman had done a translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So I had read it and studied it. And the main thing that bugged me was that I was fully conscious when I was with her. So, I wasn't a wisp of smoke, you see, when I went all the way into deep space. So it bothered me. Like, that just didn't seem to ring true to me. Some time later, I found myself in London, um, meeting with an Oxford professor. Just one of those weird coincidences and quinky dinks of life. And... When I was telling Diane this, when I shook his hand, I had this experience of, this is why you're in London. Have you ever had that, you know, you shake somebody's hand, or you're like, and you hear this like, oh, this is why you're here. Okay. This is why you're in London, to meet this guy. I kind of let that go, but I started emailing him back and forth, and then he told me this tragic news that his daughter had died. And I was trying to reach out and help him, and I had been reading Carol Bowman's book, Children's Past Lives, and I don't know if you're familiar with that, but she's a, an author who studied with Ian Stevenson in University of Virginia and also with Michael Newton. Anyway, he said to me, you, I wrote to him and said, you know, here's Carol Bowen's book. And he said, you know, you should check into the work of Michael Newton. Okay, I'd never heard of him. I picked up Michael Newton's book. Now, this is a hypnotherapist 
who in the 1960s began his practice in Los Angeles. He didn't believe in past life regression. He thought it was a waste of time. Okay? How many are you familiar with Newton's work? Okay, quite a few, but in a nutshell, he was a skeptic about past life regression. And then a client came in with a psychosomatic illness that was hurting his shoulder, and the doctors had said, we can't help you, you should go do a hypnotherapy. And Newton said, take me to the source of your pain. And this guy said, oh, it's 1916, I'm in World War I, I'm a British soldier, and I'm being stabbed by a German soldier. And he was writhing in the ground, in his mind. And Newton, the skeptic, said, oh, really? What's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? What's your regiment? <laughs> What's your favorite food? So he was like, you know, bickering with this poor guy, as he says. But ultimately, when the session was done, the guy said, my psychosomatic thing is gone. My shoulder's fine. Thank you. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate it. But that what didn't satisfy Newton. He wrote the British War Office and said, did you have a soldier of this name and rank and whatever, etc." And they did. So Newton opened his practice to past life regression. And as most hypnotherapists will tell you, it doesn't matter why a person is healed. You're just trying to help them. Okay? Whether the past life memory is accurate or not. But somewhere in the 60s, Newton's work took a turn. A woman came into his office and said, I'm really depressed, I'm suicidal, I don't have any friends, I don't fit in, I don't know why that is. And so under hypnosis, he said, take me to the source of your pain, especially if there's a group of people around. And she said, oh, I'm in the life between lives with my soul group, and we all agreed that in this lifetime I wouldn't be with them. I get it. Okay, I'm okay now. I can leave. They're all here in your office showing me that this is what we agreed to. And Newton was like, wait, 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 wait. What are you talking about? Is this in the past? Is this in the future? She said, no, it's right now. I'm experiencing this right now. We're having this conversation over there on the flip side. Newton said he, when she left his office, he basically went through his notes extensively and realized he had to find a way to go back there. And so he closed his public practice and for the next 30 years interviewed people who could take him to that location and, dis, and, and basically examined the architecture of the afterlife through 7,000 people. Okay. And so his first book was published, Journey of Souls, 1996. Now here it is, 2004, I'm having this conversation with the Oxford professor, I pick up his book, and now we go to the first chapter, and in the first chapter a guy says, I'm in the between lives realm, I'm in a classroom where everyone is dressed in white. <laughs> and they're studying something spiritual, and they're saying things I don't understand, but I completely, I mean, I don't know the language, but I understand. So I realized at that moment, <laughs> you're looking for Luana? This is the method. So I contacted Newton and the Newton Institute, and I said, I'd like to make a documentary about Michael Newton. They said, sure, <laughs> he's retired. So you can't interview him, but you know, you're welcome to attend a conference here in Chicago. They were doing a out in Schaumburg. So I flew back and I met Newton and I spoke to him for a few minutes and he went, okay, I'll do your interview. You're gonna be my last interview. So he's never done one since, he's retired, but this was his last interview. About three hours, I talked to him about his work. And then I interviewed his wife which was interesting because she corroborated things that he had said, like he never went into a religious bookstore, he was afraid of, that a title of a book would influence his questions. This is a relentless guy. He's relentless with his questionings. If you're, you know, the unfortunate thing to be under hypnosis with him. And then I said, you know, can I film some of these sessions? And they said, please do. So I started filming people under hypnosis. And look, the construct is this, it's very simple. As a jaded Hollywood guy, which I, because I've been off making films, I've written and or directed like eight features. 
and I'm making this documentary, I, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking they must be making this up. It can't be that 7,000 people said the same things about the afterlife. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, my camera will speak the truth. Let me turn the camera on while they're doing it, and I'll see, you know, is the hypnotherapist asking questions like, weren't you Cleopatra? Are you sure? Are you sure you weren't on the Titanic? I think I remember you on the Titanic. I mean, you know, this is the knock on hypnotherapy, or hypnosis, that somehow you're being influenced by it, by the questions. So, I turn my camera on. And I must tell you, I was the, and the, this is you know one of those stories where it it's a confirmation on mul multiple levels. But I turned the camera on, and they had set up a room, an auditorium like this, and there were about a hundred students watching Michael Newton sort of give notes, while Paul Oren, um, the hypnotherapist, used to be the president of the institute, did the session. The woman. Doing the session was a hypnotherapist from Sedona. She had offered to show the students a demonstration. Now, I spoke to her afterwards and I said, did you remember any of this lifetime before? Or ever a hint? Nothing. In her session, she went through her life. This is the process. You go through your life, you talk about it, you go back to your first memories, whatever it is. And then they say, let's go to a previous lifetime that has some significance on this life. And at that point, Either you go or you don't. And you can say, I don't, I don't have anything. But in this case, she went, she saw herself in a shower, naked. Her head had been shaved. She was with other women, waiting for the showers to come on. Now the jaded skeptic, and don't forget the word skeptic means somebody who doesn't believe in the prevailing school of thought. Mm -hmm. So, you are all skeptics. Let me just give that to you. Because the prevailing school of thought is that consciousness is here and created here and stays here. All of you are skeptics because you don't follow the prevailing school of thought, okay? But I'm there as the skeptic saying, really, they're gonna, she's going to remember a lifetime during the Holocaust? I mean, isn't that a little convenient for me and my camera? That's what I mean, my weird thought pattern. But anyway, she then, the hypnotherapist says, let's go to a happier time in this life. And she goes back to Poland. Her name was Anna Paczynski. I was able to find it. She names all of her children. I was able to find them. So forensically, this woman existed and did go to Auschwitz, and all of her family died there. So then he went to the point where she dies and goes into the between lives realm, which is what this methodology is. Where do you want to go, is what they say, once they get to the death scene. And the person says, almost always, I want to go home. And that's where it gets interesting. Because once you go home, there's people there. There's your loved ones. There's people you recognize. And so she sees her spirit guide, or guardian angel, whatever you want to call it, but her spirit guide, everyone has one. Some have more than one. But the spirit guide now takes her to a place of healing, which is a very common you know, thing that happens. For me, this is my first you know, example of this, so I'm, I'm like a hawk watching it. You know, what's happening? Anyway, at some point she gets to the council of elders, these, these wise beings that everybody seems to have, and she asks why. Why did I choose such a difficult lifetime? And, they, and then she says, this is going to be hard to explain, but they're showing me that it was harder to choose to play the role of a perpetrator than a victim in this life. Easily the most politically incorrect thing I've ever heard. And I really looked around the room like, where am I? What is this place? What, is, what are they trying to sell here? But I heard it over and over again. And she went on to say, every day in this lifetime was a lesson, a heightened lesson in courage, in sacrifice, in compassion, in forgiveness. And she said, from my perspective, I'm glad that I chose this experience than the people who chose the other one. Okay? The next person that I filmed remembered a lifetime where she drowned on a ship in 1887, which I was able to find. 
And, and she, she's a, a man, and she's saying, hey, they pushed me off the ship and I'm drowning. And the captain is laughing, and she's swearing like a sailor. But, but at some point, she gets into the between lives realm, and she says, oh, I see, I was a bad person. I had been stealing food from all the other, my comrades, and they had voted me off the ship because we had run aground. And then she said, and now the captain, I can see him coming to me through this mist, and he's holding my hand, and he's saying, you have no idea how hard it was to do that to you in this lifetime. And then she said, I recognize him, he's my father. And he saved me from drowning when I was three. Something she wasn't consciously aware of, but saw it. Saw the experience. She knew that she had almost drowned at three, but she didn't know the circumstances, and saw him jumping off a pier and saving her life. And I filmed this woman. She had severe aquaphobia. She had not been able to swim her whole life, and I filmed her swimming about a month after this session. Okay, so now we get to Rich. <laughs> And Michael Newton says to uh, Paul, after I've been filming all these sessions, you know, Rich, what about you? Do you want to try one of these things? You know, maybe it's something you might want to try. I thought, well, there goes my objectivity. You know, if I do a session, I can't be reporting on it. But then I thought, you know, George Plimpton, Paper Tiger. You know, he would just take on the guise of that role, and then he would report on it. So, okay, I said, sure, let's do that. And so they, uh, they said, you know, it's Friday, you're going to do a session. It's going to be about four or five hours. Plan it for it to be about that. And I thought, oh, this is great. I can prove it's fake. I can prove it's false because I'm not going there to find somebody or find something. I'm actually not going to let them ask me if I'm seeing something if I don't. Right? I can prove it's fake. Or not. So they ask you to write out a list of questions. And I wrote down about 10 questions, just in case. And it was, I swear, it was like Thursday night, about 2 in the morning, I wrote some of these questions. You know, what about this? What about this dream that I had? What does that mean? And I, I tucked them into my pocket, and I forgot about the list. Then I went to the session, and believe me, has anyone here been hypnotized? A few. And more people on this side for some reason. I don't know what's that about. You're all under hypnosis now. No. Well, I'm sure you know from the experience and for everybody else, under hypnosis is a misnomer. You're never under anything. It's like exactly, especially in this case, a guided meditation. If everybody's done a guided meditation, you know, picture yourself on a boat on a river. That's exactly what it is. The only difference is, after about a half hour of picturing yourself on a boat by a river, you can ask your subconscious questions, which your conscious mind is like a bouncer trying to stop that information from coming through. But eventually, if you allow it to come through, and this is what they say, just whatever comes to your mind, don't judge it. Don't judge it. Very hard to do. So I was there, and we went through my life, you know, and he said, let's go when you're age 11 something. And I saw myself in Northbrook. I had just taken an ax, tried to make a bow and arrow, like we used to do back in the 60s. I don't want to buy that. I'll make my own. You know, and I used the ax this way, and it cut my finger nearly off. And I was there looking at the blood. And, and then I saw my father come out of the garage, who had passed away some years before this experience. And I felt that feeling, oh, Dad's here. He's going to save me. So I was conscious mind saying, oh, that's interesting. You can access the emotional memory of when you were 11. Interesting. <laughs> the 11-year-old is going, Dad, save me. So now they, they eventually say, let's go to your first memory. And my first memory was about 600 yards from here. <laughs> coming out of a dark space and into a very bright space. And then seeing this St. Francis Hospital doctor with his mask on, and that weird metal thing they used to wear in the 50s and 60s. What's that called? Reflector. Reflector? Oh, all right, so not really a medical term, but yeah, okay. A reflector. 
And he's looking at me. I can see him clearly, his green eyes. I see his face right now as I talk about it. I can see him clearly looking at me, but he's holding me up like this, you know, by my feet. But I wasn't upside down. I was right side up. Mm -hmm. And the hypnotherapist said, is your dad here? And I said, no, he's on his way here. He's driving here. Now, that wasn't a detail I had a conscious knowledge of, and I called my mom after the session. Where was dad? He was driving there. <laughs> so then they ask you, let's go to a lifetime that has some significance to this life. And, again, I wasn't going to be led. So when I just saw darkness, 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 I said, I don't see anything. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't see anything. And I kept saying it, thinking, you know what? This is going to have to wrap up pretty quickly. And he said, hypnotherapist who trained the uh, Jimmy Quast from Maryland, did all the training. He said, nah, Rich, just look down. And in my mind's eye, oh, <laughs> I see something. I see naked feet in a creek. He said, are you a man or a woman? I'm a man. What are you wearing? Buckskin. And conscious mind now pulls the image back, and I see an American Indian standing in buckskin, long hair. Conscious mind laughing. Oh, really? Is this what you're going to come up with? Is this what you're going to imagine for this session, that you were an American Indian? Literally, like, mocking myself. But again, I've been asked to just speak. He says, uh, what are you? I said, I'm a Lakota. I'm a medicine man. He said, um, what's your name? I said, Watanka. Conscious mind, oh, you saw Dances with Balls. <laughs> Come on, you know that Tatanka means buffalo, and you're, you're, you're so bad at this making it up, you can't even come up with a name that makes sense. Watanka. Come on, Rich. Literally. Subconscious mind saying, um, he says, let's go to your tribe. Let's go look at your, your people. I said, eh, I don't want to do that right now. Why is that? And then I saw why. A massacre. A tribe. Everyone dead. Blood everywhere. Smoke rising. I found myself walking to a teepee, which I've never actually touched before in this life, but I'm feeling it. I can feel the leather, the skin. And I open it up, and I see a woman lying on the ground black hair, and her throat's been cut, and there's blood. And I say, they've killed my wife and taken my son. And I had the emotion of that sentence. I won't go there now. But for a long time, just saying it, I had to go there. And the, the sobbing that came over me. I've never had an experience, knock on wood, like that in this lifetime. So experiencing it, I was thinking to myself, conscious mind, Wow, you're, this is what you're going to come up with? This is really painful. This is the most painful thing I've ever experienced. And then he said, well, who did this? And I said, ah, fucking Huron. Conscious mind. Huron? Upstate New York? Lakota? Montana. Dude, you're making this up. You're really making up this weird story. So I let that go. I let it go. Six months later, I'm in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, at that young girl's mother's funeral. My cousin. And I'm talking to her brother. <laughs> These things always bring up emotions. I apologize. I'm talking to her <clears throat> brother, Coyne Jr. And he says, I go, what have you been doing, Coyne? He says, well, I've been a historian of sorts for the Lakota. <laughs> and I said, well, what? How did that happen? And he told me this incredible story when he was a young boy, how he, the tribe had adopted him. They had, some guys had met him, and they, they had brought him into the, their ways, and they had taught him their history. So I said, oh, well, you've got to hear this story. And so I started to lay it out for him. He said, hold on a second. Wait, before you get anywhere, just tell me, what were you wearing? I said, buckskin. He said, so um, did you have feathers? I said, yeah. He said, how many? I said, two. He said, were they up? He did that. Were they up? I said, no, they were down. They were in my hair. He said, well, that means you were a medicine man. <laughs> okay, so why did I say my name was Watanka? And he said, well, Wakantanka means the great spirit. 
And that would have been a derivative of that word. Really? Okay, what about the Huron? <laughs> he laughed and said, you're sitting in the spot where they fought for 60 years. Eau Claire. Cryptomnesia, science tells us that memories that you have of previous lifetimes are something you heard, saw, read, or could access somehow. None of those three details are easily accessible. I've seen them all since then because I've done the forensic research. But I couldn't look up Watanka until I looked up Wakantanka, you see? So in that moment, my cousin was able to verify that stuff for me in a really dramatic way. Okay. And now in the between life realm, we go to the last day of this lifetime. That's what they say. Let's go to the last day of this lifetime. And I saw myself drunk, bottle of whiskey. Um, and by the way, I was at a Thanksgiving dinner and somebody had a bottle of whiskey from like 1860 and we all passed around, you know, a glass. And I went, ah, that's the flavor. I know that. <laughs> fire water. I mean, it literally tastes like water that's got some kind of a fire in it. I kid you not. Anyway. So, I saw myself drowning myself, walking into, I think it was the Mississippi, big muddy river. Hypnotherapist says, why are you doing this? I said, they've taken everything from me, my culture, my people, my religion. I'm a shell. Why stay here? And as I said it, I thought, wow, that, you know, conscious mind, wow, that was pretty good dialogue. Yeah, I like that. I mean, you're making up this story. I like that. That was good. He said, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go home. And I had that journey. Okay? Going deep space, getting to a place where I'm feeling unconditional love. You've heard it so many times here. Going through the light. I come face to face with an older gentleman whose face I can see right now, and he's greeting me. And I realize, oh, this is my guide. But he's greeting me like, how you doing? Are you okay? It's not like what Newton had written about. People usually see their guide and their, their, this emotional saying of, there's my mentor. It was like, there's my pal. He took me to a healing place. That's all I can describe it as, and it felt like I was sitting in a chair surrounded by electrical lights, and, I, and it was like I was reconnecting with my spirit that's back there at all times. When you do this research, you find out that a third of our energy is in our body, roughly. Somewhere between 20 to 40 percent is what most people say. Two thirds of us is always back there in classrooms, teaching, learning, moving on. This is what people say, okay? So I had that experience. And then he took me in to meet my council of elders. No, for lack of a better term. Eight people that I saw clearly, as clear as I see you folks. And I had this rush of like standing here. I was at a podium. And I felt like just before you go on stage, that kind of weird butterfly thing. I'm like, this is going to be fun. I'm going to hear myself talk. That would be great. And I felt that. And here they were, and they had this buzz going on, like, oh, it's this dude. You know, he's hilarious. So I had that weird experience, not what had been written in any other case I'd ever seen. So, and now the hypnotherapist says, I've got your list of questions here. I'd handed it to him. I said, it's okay, I've already asked. I remember I wrote it down. I wasn't looking at it. I just put it away. I folded it up. I handed it to him. I knew them all as if I had memorized them. And the questions were pretty profound. Weird things that I had heard in a dream, etc. and they explained them all. But we got to the question, why did I choose Rich? Why did I choose this guy? And the answer I got, which I said, every thought, action, or word, or deed contains energy. So you sing a song, you write a book, you make a movie, your inner energy, you want to call it subatomic or quantum level, goes into the work. And people who read it, see it, hear it, experience it, feel it like a wave that moves out through the universe and has a healing nature to it. And Rich, you've had so many lifetimes in a healing process, including this 
this Indian medicine man that you decided you would try filmmaking as a method of healing. They said, laughter creates an instant change in disposition. Belly laughs will change your health. They said, tears work, but they require catharsis. I'd never heard catharsis in a sentence, but there it was. Oh, okay, yeah, tears, yeah, you cry and then you get through it. But your choice was to do this comedic thing. And then I said, I'm just sorry I didn't choose somebody more successful at it. <laughs> and the council laughed. And so did the hypnotherapist. Yeah, so I had this weird experience of getting laughs from two sides of the veil at the same time. But I also said, I have a feeling that's going to change. And so when I started, when I started putting, so I started filming, and I filmed like 30 hours of people, and I went all over the world, and I filmed people under deep hypnosis. I started interviews with hypnotherapists. When I put the footage together, that's when I realized, oh, this is a book. This is a book. I have to transcribe what they're saying, because, you know, you have six-hour sessions. And I had, you know, like 20. By turning it into a book, six hours is 10 pages. So I was able to come out with Flipside and, and show it around. And, and um, I was just saying to a gentleman here earlier, I did a book talk in Santa Monica, and I just put a camera up, like I do wherever I go, and I put it online. And somebody in Virginia Beach saw it and at the Ions there and asked me to come and speak there. So I went to the Virginia Beach Ions, and on the way they said, we're going to stop at Bruce Grayson's um, DOP Center at UVA. This, friend, this woman was friends with Bruce. I was like, great, who's that? She said, look him up. <laughs> so I looked up, oh my God, the father of near-death experience, or the godfather, whatever you want to call it. He's been doing all this research. He's this, ah, what a weird coincidence I'd be staying at his house. So I wrote to him and I said, you know, I just want to present this research to you of people under deep hypnosis. He said, send me 10 books. He gave it to everyone in his the, the, the Division of Perceptual Studies, which are all scientists at the University of Virginia, including Dr. Grayson, and there's Dr. Ed Kelly, who went to Harvard, and there's Dr. Jim Tucker. I'm sure you're familiar with his books. He's taken over for Ian Stevenson in Reincarnation Studies. Return to Life is his best-selling book. So I'm there speaking to this room full of scientists, presenting the research. And Dr. Grayson says, you know, Rich, science doesn't consider hypnosis a valid scientific tool. For a variety of reasons, including a person's not well and they want to get cured, and the doctor wants to cure them, so maybe they're making this stuff up, you see. Also for, and I said, well, I agree with you, the way you guys have been doing it since Freud. Hour-long sessions on a couch, you don't get very deep. In Newton's case, six-hour sessions asking neutral questions. Are you a boy or a girl? Where do you want to go? When you have six hours with a person, they'll tell you where they want to go. I want to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but you have that experience. You are the person driving. You see? It's a different thing than a hypnotherapist saying, why don't we talk to... In this case, you're doing the journey. And so... But at that moment, I realized I needed to expand my research. I needed to move into other areas. And so that's what this book, It's a Wonderful Afterlife, came out of it. And I interviewed Dr. Grayson and Gary Schwartz, who's been here. Gary wrote the introduction to Flipside, but, but he gave this great talk about the soul phone. You know, that 100 years from now, the way the Wright brothers 100 years ago could never have foreseen flight the way it is today. Talking about this stuff and, and reducing the veil, is what apparently it's what's happening. Talking about this stuff is altering people's ability to keep it out. It appears that the filters that are in place in our brain that keep information so that we can live our life. I'm, you know, I was fond of saying, who wants to be the guy running around the stage going, it's all a play! <laughs> Hey everybody, it's a play. This is don't take it so seriously. Boo, get off stage. You know, you ruin the play. So 
I expanded it into using science as my backdrop. Talking to some, yeah, Mario Beauregard, the University of Montreal, who wrote Brain Wars. Wonderful person to have come and talk. Many cases that he had of people who had, you know, been dead, not just clinically dead, but you know, no oxygen to the brain for seven minutes and have fully conscious, including Fred and I were talking about some blind man who came back and saw and reported the color of everyone's shoes. Something who would have been blind from birth. So what I'm trying to do in this research and to tie it together is to examine near-death experiences, examine between-life episodes or sessions, talk to mediums who appear to be contacting somebody on the flip side, and compare, compare them to see how do they connect up, as opposed to just leaving one discipline at a time. And that has opened the door to other people contacting me. So for example, an attorney called me up, um, which she's in the book, called me up, I'll, she's from a western state, I won't say where, because of my confidentiality, but she said she represents second degree murderers, basically. People who, drunk drivers, you know, they were convicted of second degree murder. And she's defending them in court let's say, or trying to work things out. And she said, every case that she's dealt with in the past 30 years had some element of the victim coming to visit the person who killed them, either in a dream, a manifestation, a physical manifestation, or seeing them at the end of their bed, saying relatively the same thing. I'm okay, and I can help you. You know, my, my brain was swimming when she said it, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How many cases? All of them. So what did they do? Well, there's no syntax for us to talk about this stuff. Some of them committed suicide. Some of them became alcoholics. Some of them she lost touch with. And then oddly enough, just recently, and I mentioned this on my blog, richmartini.com, a case in Seattle, this is last month, this guy had killed all these people and he was in the sentencing phase, so he had already been found guilty. In the sentencing phase, he suddenly spoke up, they said, well, do you have any final words before we pass sentence on you? He said, they all came to visit me in a dream and they said, we're okay, we can help you. Needless to say, there was an uproar in the court. You know, what's he doing? This is terrible. How dare you say that? You know, and of course, that's why you don't hear this stuff. Who is, who's going to reveal that their client came to them and said that the person they killed is okay? So when you combine all of this research to talk about what the journey of souls is about, when you start to examine these stories of what happened, so, for example, if you're under deep hypnosis, you might say, describe this previous lifetime to me. And they'll say any variation you can think of. I committed suicide in that lifetime. Yeah. So then you can say, well, so then what happened? Well, I went back home, and my loved ones were all there looking at me really disappointed because I had screwed up their plan. We had all agreed to come and experience a certain kind of life, but I screwed it up because I, we all have free will, and I just didn't want to be on stage any longer, and I jumped off the stage. But they said to me, we still love you. We'll get it right the next time. Wow, that's really profound. As well as talking to people who said, I experienced this journey because I needed to examine the energy of that act. So, for example, there's a friend of mine from Northbrook who read Flipside, called me up and said, Richard, are you crazy? Um, I said, no, it's in the research. She said, well, I want to do one of these sessions. I said, yeah, please, come on out. On the way out to the session, she said, a couple of things I've never told anyone. I was molested as a kid, and my brother 
OD'd, committed suicide. I've known her since grade school, so I, I was like, I'm so sorry, that's terrible, you know. I, we've done cross-country trips together, she never mentioned any of this, but I'm so sorry, maybe this hypnotherapy can help you in some way. And she said, yeah, I'm hoping so. So um, when we got to the session, she said to the hypnotherapist, you know, I really don't want to go over this life so much because there's a lot of therapy involved with this life. I'd really like to skip down. And she did. And she reported this life of, uh, it's in the book, she's a captain aboard an English ship in 1610, which I found. And I found the street and name of the person that she said she was from the English book of records. You know, they put every uh, case from the old Bailey's online and I found this guy's name and address, the same, same street, same place in London. I always try to look up these details, you know, what town were they from, et cetera, et cetera. Get as close as you can. And then at some point she saw herself as a teacher of a classroom in the Between Lives realm. And she said, oh, this is weird. It's like I went out for a cigarette. They've been waiting for me to come back to finish this class in energy transformation. And I, and I was, you know, I'm asking, I'm slipping notes to the hypnotherapist to ask, you know, what's the class about? What are they doing? And she said, we're demonstrating how group, a group can focus on a particular object, no matter what its size, and lift it. And she said, there's 26 students here, and they've all lifted this giant rock. And she says, she said, I can do it on my own, and I use my hands to show them, but I don't really need to use my hands. I just do that for effect. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, you know, like a teacher who's got to do this, you know. But she doesn't need to. I mean, what an odd detail. But at some point we got to the question about what about this thing that happened to you as a kid? And she said, oh, I see, okay. I signed up to participate so that I could teach this person the negativity of his actions. She saw that moment when she made that agreement. I can handle that. I'm an old soul. It's not going to harm me. And then the hypnotherapist said, what about your brother? And she said, oh. He signed up to experience the energy of excess. I've never heard that phrase before. And the hypnotherapist said, I'm so sorry he wasn't able to fulfill that. And she said, no, no, actually, that's what he signed up for, to go through that experience. So what are people telling us? We all know when Roger Ebert died, or maybe we don't all know it, but Roger Ebert passed away just before he died. He said, he said, he wrote a note to his wife that was, it's all an elaborate hoax. And she said, what? What's an elaborate hoax? Earlier, he had died, and he had communicated with her. She was in the hospital, he had died, he had coded, they were, they were unplugging him. And his voice came into her head and said, I'm not dead. You need to revive me. I have more work to do. She heard that. She said to the doctors, you've got to revive him. And they did. He lived for another couple of years. But even then, he didn't believe in the afterlife. And he wrote an article about it. Even though this happened to my wife, the one person he loved the most he couldn't accept that that might be proof right there. You know, you spoke to her from this other realm and said, revive me. He still didn't get it, but at some point he did get it. But his, you know, and Roger was a wordsmith, as we all know. You know, those five words together, that's what he chose. It's all an elaborate hoax. Okay, for my money, hoax implies a negative thing, right? So, if he had said it's all an elaborate movie, it would have made more sense that we all play parts and play roles, etc., etc. Which then takes us back to the Sacred Heart Cemetery. 
you know, as we live our life and we see our friends and people check out, however they check out, they leave the stage, however they leave the stage, you know, what are people other than the echoes of footsteps in our minds, our loved ones? You know, they exist in our minds, of course. They've passed away. They still exist in our minds. But what the research shows, what these countless reports show, is that they're not dead. They're just not here. They've stepped through their door. And when you read the reports, you'll see everybody has a different experience. It's not like everybody just steps off the boat and they're on the landing and everybody waves. Everybody has a different experience. You've heard the many different near-death experiences, right? Where they suddenly see something great or something negative or whatever. That's the, and partially that's according to what I'm reading is it's based on what your whole lifetime has been an experience of. So that your first initial experience, and this happened also in one of the sessions that I was filming, another person from my hometown who came out and did this session, where she remembered a lifetime in Egypt, and the first initial thing that she experienced was a lot of smoke and ash, and, and, and uh, with gnashing of teeth, that term, and the smell of sulfur, and very uncomfortable to be there. But in this form of therapy, your hypnotherapist is like a Sherpa who travels with you wherever you are. In your death experience, you don't have that benefit, you know, because you're by yourself experiencing these things. But in this case, you've got a Sherpa right by your side who says, why are we here? Why did you come to this place? And as she examined it, it dissipated. It disappeared. Because she saw that she chose, this was what she expected as a young Egyptian girl, that this is what the afterlife was going to be. Interestingly enough, just a weird little confirmation, she, as she passed away, she said, I see this beautiful woman waving to me. And she described her, this tall woman with black hair and wearing this incredible necklace, beautiful multicolored necklace. And she's waving to me, and she said, I can't tell if it's a statue or if it's a person, but she's greeting me. Oh my God, she's so beautiful. And then she went into this, you know, sort of dark, vision. And then the hypnotherapist sort of brought her back and said, hey, let's go back and see that person that was waving to you. Who is that? So she went back there and everything disappeared and now she was back in front of this woman and she said, her name is Ashita. You know, and of course, whatever that means, right? You know, she's saying it in Egyptian, I guess. And he says, well, spell that for me. And she said, A S pronounced Sh. T. Ashita. Okay. A couple hours later, we were driving back to Los Angeles in my car, and she was driving, and I'm, I'm there, you know, Googling. <laughs> A-S-T, Egypt. Isis. That's how you say Isis in Egyptian. And there's a picture of her. Tall, dark-haired woman with a beautiful necklace. You see? The thing that she imagined she was going to see, she did see. Now, did she really see a person? Yes, it's possible. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But I can tell you that in all the cases I've examined, even in your near-death experience, you experience something, and it kind of, you, you experience certain hallmarks that are common to all of experiences, whether it's moving through a light, whether it's a feeling of unconditional love, or an apotheosis of some sort, those are the same things that people say under deep hypnosis. And what I call deep hypnosis now is a near-death experience without the near-death part. <laughs> or as I'm fond of saying, a near-life experience. Because just think about it for a second. If what I'm saying is true, and what these thousands of people are saying is true, this, this ain't the ball game. It's somewhere else. Home is not here. This is the gridiron, to be sure. And some of us are courageous to choose lifetimes to come out into the gridiron. You know, 
Like, if you're going to play in that soccer match, give it all. Get out there and get in the mix. You know, really try, really go hard, hard, hard. And of course, some people get hurt in the game, and they get on the sidelines, and they're like, "What am I doing here? This is crazy. I don't, I don't want to be part of this game anymore." But it's really hard to get in the game. It's very difficult to make that choice to be born, to connect with your loved ones. Okay. So, um, what I like to do is I, I ask people. This question, think of your most significant person that you've met in your lifetime. Just consider that for a second. It might be your husband or wife. It might be whoever it is. And think of the moment you first met them. In that, and I don't mean like the story you've told everybody, I call it the Reader's Digest version, you know, version of, you know, where we worked at the same place and, you know, we kind of dated and then he started asking me out and then one thing I led to, etc. I'm saying go to the moment when you realize that was the person you were going to be with. And when you really examine that, and I can't do it here because there's so many of us, but when you really examine it, and I've heard this time and time again, people will say, I don't know, but something in his voice, something in his eyes, I've heard this, made me feel like I was home. Mm -hmm. So, in these cases, in the many, many cases I've studied, I've filmed 25 sessions so far. I've chosen the people to film because I knew they were skeptics or I knew their background so I could, when they, you know, talked about what it was like growing up in their town, I could tell if they were lying or not because I was there. In all 25 cases, they all had the same experience, which is they wanted to go home. At some point, they met their wise elders and asked the question, as we all would, how am I doing? You know, we all go through regret. You know, even myself. If my career had only gone this way instead of that way. But the question is always asked, how am I doing? And the answer is always the same. You're doing great. You're doing exactly what you signed up for. And you should give yourself some more credit for getting this far. Because not everybody gets that far, right? I mean, you know, look around this room. We're all still here. As my mom used to say up into her 86th year, I'm still here. How you doing? I'm still here. <laughs> you know, we all go through those tragic moments in our lifetime where we try to get from A to B. But as it turns out, the most difficult experiences that you signed up for are lessons that you can go through. So the stone in your past, once you're on the other side of the stone and you turn around and look at it, it's gold. It's a golden lesson. A lot of times in compassion, a lot of times in forgiveness. The last question I had before the, my session ended, by the way, I've done four now. Four times I've gone to see Luana. I've gone to her classroom. I've met her teacher. I saw her in the back of the class. Just an auditorium, not unlike this. She's sitting in the back row, typical, but 21 years old, ponytail. I didn't know her but I recognize her, and she looks at me and says, what are you doing here? Are you on a talk show or something? Because I saw myself up here in her classroom. And, and the hypnotherapist said, what's this? Oh, let me, let me just tell you. So there were two experiences. He said, where would you like to go? And I said, well, I want to go visit a classroom. So I saw myself in this classroom, and just like here, you know, there was a backdrop, there was a teacher, and I appeared right in the middle of the class. And all the students you know, turned to look at me like, what the hell? Who are you? Except in this case, they were kind of like, oh, it's a teacher's friend. Because the teacher was saying, oh, this is my friend Richard. Let's just say that was what she called me. She called me something else, but whatever. This is my pal. And everybody was like, oh, that's great. And she said, I said, what's this class about? No, I'm sorry. I, I said, do you mind if I explain your class? It's energy reconstruction. I said that past life memories, listen, this is not something I'm consciously aware of. I'm just telling you what I said, okay? 
I said, past life memories travel around our lifetimes in geometric shapes. People see them sometimes in, during these sessions, but they're geometric shapes, fractals, that contain all of our previous memories. And they travel through our lifetimes like ball bearings. Mm -hmm. They help us when we're in times of trouble. So if I need to access some information from a previous lifetime, it's always around, like a hard drive flying around that you can't see, but is, is fractal in nature. I didn't even know what a fractal was. I had to look it up. But that it was carrying this past life information. And I said, in this classroom, they clean up these fractals because they, they, they accumulate junk or gunk at some point, like anything energetic would. And this class was teaching the students how to clean up these geometric shapes. I'm telling you, I said it. It made sense as I was saying it, but it was like somebody else was talking. And then the hypnotherapist said, where would you like to go next? And I said, oh, I want to go see Luana. Okay. Now I was in a classroom in spirituality. Everyone was dressed in white. <laughs> Teacher was up at the front. I described him as a green color, because you see people vibrate over there in a different color. But I appeared in the middle of the classroom, and I said, well, I'm in Luana's class. And they all turned around like, who is this jerk talking and interrupting? This is such an important class, you're like an idiot. <laughs> and I had that feeling, you know, people looking at you like the intruder. So it was funny because, you know, in the earlier construct, everybody was like, oh, a teacher's pet, you know, blah, blah, blah. But now it's like, get that, get out. And I said, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. I don't think I'm supposed to be talking like this. And then I said, but, you know, it took me a while. That's a long way to come for not describing where I am. So I said, this is a class in energy healing. And so healers that work here on the earth get these people who are in this classroom as helpers. And they help channel the white healing light of the universe through the client and into the patient. And a student turned around and said, you don't know what you're talking about. Well, just think about that for a second. I'm explaining like this profundity, and the student goes, shut up. You don't know what you're saying. And I realized, okay, you're right. I said, okay, okay. Listen, it's more complex than that because in this class, the healer, because people sign up for a lifetime, and so maybe they signed up to experience the energy of an illness, and they want to go all the way through and experience it all the way through. So they didn't sign up to be healed. And doctors come in, they sign up to help people and heal people, and they're not even communicating with their conscious mind, but they're asking these people to help them. And sometimes the doctor needs to experience losing a client, losing a patient. So it's a very complex concept of what they're doing here. And it, that, that satisfied the guy. Okay, you do know what you're talking about. All I can tell you is a profound experience holding Luana's hand, looking her in the eye, and saying, hey, buddy, what are you doing? And now I've done, like I say, four sessions at each time. And this last one I did about just before I finished this book, because I thought, ah, let's do another one. It was like time had frozen, like, she, like, in, like the incident had happened yesterday. So here it was two years later. And now I'm back in the classroom, and she's taking me to the teacher, and she's apologizing on my behalf. She says, I just want to apologize. This guy, you know, he's, he's writing this book, and he came here to look. And she's giving this elaborate apology on my behalf. You know, and the teacher's kind of like, yes, but no. But, you know, it's not really accepted here, but okay, all right, all right. And so then eventually he turned and faced me and said, what do you want to know? because I hadn't done it politely. Who knew? Who knew you gotta be polite in the afterlife? <laughs> I didn't know, you know, I just barged into the room. You know, I, I asked him, you know, about the healing process and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I had the experience of, you know, him imparting this wisdom to me. So, can everybody do that? Yes, I think so. Does everybody have their own unique experience? Yes, that's what I think so, because I've filmed enough sessions with people that they have a variation on the same theme. So 
I experienced going to a library of souls, like an Akashic library, but it was my version of it. Other people go to different versions of it. But they're libraries. There's no other word for them where knowledge exists. And you can access previous lifetimes, look at them, examine them, look at possible life outcomes that you didn't choose at the time, etc., etc. It's pretty profound stuff. Which now takes us back to Sacred Heart Cemetery. So here we are among the tombstones of all of our loved ones. People that are, have been on the planet and on that journey. Hard to access them because it's a name written in cement. But of course, they're still in existence. There's a door that existed in my home in Northbrook and it had maybe 150 names on it. Everybody that came by our house, we put the pencil and write the date. And when the time came, my parents passed away and we had to sell the house. We were going to tear it down. And my friend Linda offered to take that door. And it exists in her house. So I can go and I can touch the door. All the, and there's people here in this room that are on that door. They exist in my hand. I can feel them as I touch the door. It's no different than your loved ones who are not here that want to communicate with you, but they need you to calm your spirit, to meditate, to go inward. We just, I was talking to my cousin here, we were just, we just had a very interesting conversation because I asked her about someone who passed away and she, I said, has this person ever contacted you? She said, yes, in a dream. And I said, what did he say? He said, take out the pictures. Look at the photographs. I said, what he means is, because this is based on the research, photographs are portals. They exist in time and space. The camera captures time and space. Magnetized, but it exists. Their energetic pattern is there. It's easier for them, if you think about people on the flip side, to contact you through a portal that they understand and can access. So you want to talk to somebody who's not on the planet? This is how you do it. Take out a picture of them. Picture them alive. Picture them here. Picture them in present tense. Ask them the question you want to know the answer to. Okay? That's my flip side tip for you. So, one last thing. During a session, I brought a film producer from, who worked on a lot of uh, you know, big movies. And she said, look, I don't believe in anything what you're saying. I don't believe there's an afterlife. I think you're just full of baloney. However, I'm having an operation done on my ovary and I heard the hypnosis might help. So, and by the way, she's fine. But she said, you know, I'm going to do this session just to see it. And within 20 minutes, she was in a lifetime in 1820 and I, you know, I was able to document all this stuff about her. But, before we got to the session, I said, have you written any questions down? She said, no, I'm not going to get anywhere. I can't be hypnotized. <laughs> well, maybe you should write some questions. So she wrote three. The three questions. What's the meaning of the shift? Back in 2012, people were talking about a shift in consciousness. What's the meaning of the shift? Number two, is the universe a machine? That's from her atheist, skeptical point of view. And then the third, she said, all right, what or who is God? <laughs> Great questions. So now we get to a point where she's in the, her library and she's talking to this older soul who seems very annoyed with being asked questions, but he says, well, all right, I'm here. So ask the questions. What's your question? What's the meaning of the shift? Oh, you humans, you always feel the need to name things as if that's somehow going to help you understand it. <laughs> But, you want to understand a shift in consciousness? Imagine yourself a crab walking on the ocean floor. And you open your eyes and realize you're in an ocean. It hit me like a thunderbolt, you know. We live in an oxygen universe. We don't treat oxygen as if it's water. It's almost water, as we know. But it exists and moves and operates like water. It's all, we, we breathe it in, we let it go, etc., etc. We don't see it that way. So if a shift in consciousness is to see you're in an ocean, 
You see? I thought that was pretty deep. Then the second thing, is the universe a machine? He said, yes it is. It's a mechanism, he said. However, it's sentient. I don't know what that means. I assume it means like if you learn something, that the universe learns it. But I don't know. That's what he said. The third question. I was on the edge of my seat. <laughs> what or who is God? Okay. He said, God is beyond the capacity of the human brain to comprehend. It's not physically possible to do so. You know, at first I thought he was ducking the question. And then I realized, oh, like a computer, you know, too much information, you, that it doesn't process, it stops. Beyond the capacity to understand. Then he said, however, you can experience God. I had been saying to people, you know, if you talk to a bushman in the Kalahari Desert and you say, here's what it's like to be in a swimming pool, he looks at you like, what? You know, you jump in the water, you swim around. You know, he doesn't have a concept of it. He's never seen it, he's never heard it. He can't, he can't know it by talking, but he can experience it. And once you experience jumping in a pool, you know it. You're not thinking about the molecules that are water. You're experiencing it, you know it. So he said, you can experience God by opening your heart to everyone and to all things. Very difficult to open your heart to everyone. Guy pointing a gun at you. Guy in Fox News. A guy somewhere who's threatening you. Hard to open your heart to everyone. But if you hear what he's saying, that is the near-death experience. People go into the between lives realm and feel a connection to everyone. Because we are connected to everyone. Like I started about the Sacred Heart, it reaches out and connects to everyone. But, he said, and to all things. Does that mean? The next time you look at a tree, think of it as a lung. It's shaped like a lung. It functions like a lung, doesn't it? You breathe the oxygen, you know, it takes the carbon out, and then it gives you oxygen. Trees are lungs. So if we suddenly accept that we have to open our heart to trees, everything, then we start treating it with respect, don't we? We start to treat the planet with respect. What's the point of polluting water if our heart is open to it? Or polluting the air if our heart's open to it? Or the earth? So, I end on the sacred heart notion that in order to experience God, you know, the idea that God is love, you know, that's a great bumper sticker. But I, it occurs to me that the concept of love, the thing that connects us, the thing that we don't have a definition of, just like consciousness, nobody has a definition of love, but we can experience it, can't we? One-on-one, -on -one, connected. You want to experience God, open your heart to everyone and all things. It's not that God is love, but love, or what we know that to be, is what God is. Okay, that's it. <laughs> we only have eight minutes. I wanted to give uh, some time just to, for a few questions. Because uh, maybe some people have, maybe you don't. I'll just keep talking. Anybody have a question? Go ahead. Just say 9-11 is a good example, World right? Trade World Trade Center, Center many, many things. No and, and again, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a filmmaker and I'm a journalist. So I can only refer to what people say. Right? The research. I can tell you that people say that prior to those big mass extinction events, that there's a conversation between soul guides and the people who either agree or disagree to participate. We have free will. As you know, not everyone went to the towers that day. But the people who did, according to these reports from various sources, 
agreed to participate in that event, sometimes because they were shown that in a future lifetime, you and your wife, who are not going to be connected for this duration, are going to have this wonderful event happen in the future. When you start to see each journey as being a stage performance, and when I say, okay, we got a thousand performances, but in performance 599, you're going to get shot on stage. You can say, no, I don't want to do that. But you can say, yeah, okay, I can experience that. I'm not mitigating people's pain in any stretch of the imagination. I'm just reporting. In cases of, of mass extinction, like in Cambodia, in, in Russia, in China, millions of people die. You gotta remember, they aren't dead. They're not dead. They're just not here. So once you allow that into your consciousness, then you've got to ask, well, why did you do that? Why did you agree to do that? It's up to them, and you can't judge why they agreed to do it, because only they can answer it. I can't tell you why somebody would agree. I couldn't. I would say, no, I don't want to do that. That's too painful. But people do. If you, if you inquire to their soul group, if you find somebody who is in their soul group, you can ask them, and they'll say, oh, the reason they experienced that event was because of this thing that happened in the Civil War. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned the classroom. Uh, when I had my near-death experience, I was giving a TED Talk. Oh, like, great. Um, and um, I great. said, uh, I had just been shot in the face, uh -huh. so I had no face. And um, I was giving a talk to a room full of people, and I said, as you can see, the simulation is quite uh, real. <laughs> and then, and then I was like, like, like back on the streets of Chicago. So wow. the classroom thing, uh, what you mentioned about how it's different for everybody, for me it was like me giving a TED talk. Excellent. And a perfect example of what people say under deep hypnosis. So let's, if you examine it for a second, it's to show everybody I'm not in any pain. Right. You know, I, I was just saying this this morning. If, you've, if you're in the audience with your loved ones and watching somebody perform, you know, if every lifetime they end up surrounded by their loved ones and they die a slow, quiet death, at some point, as an audience, you go, that's not that interesting anymore. <laughs> I've seen you do that a hundred times. However, that day when you got your face shot off, oh my God, we had no idea. That was such a brilliant, well, you know, congratulations. Because look, you know, there's no pain over there. There's only education and learning. What an experience. And watching the world come back. I'm like, okay, let's go back to the simulation now, shall we? Oh, wow. Like, so, really simulation. What a fantastic word, an elaborate hoax. Simulation. We're back in the simulation. Here we are in the simulation. Now, am I cheating by telling people this stuff? I don't know. Am I the guy running around the stage going, it's all a simulation? <laughs> Here's my conclusion. The veil is thinning, and the reason it's thinning is because we're talking about it, we're allowing it to exist or happen, it's changing who we are. You know, the severe autism cases, when kids watch themselves behave a certain way, they've shown that the, the brain rewires itself. So we're rewiring our brains to experience for some reason. I think it's because the planet needs our help. It's a possibility. Anybody else? Right. Yeah, so essentially what he's saying uh, is, what I've heard is that this is all an illusion. Well, illusion, simulation, hoax, I think of it as all a fantastic carnival. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and when you look at it that way, like, who's going to show up in the clown mask today? <laughs> Me. You know, and so it is really this class half full. I must say, I just read the book by Eric Medhus, channelingeric.com, E-R-I-K. His mother is a doctor. He passed away, self-inflicted gunshot wound. But he came and visited his mother and called her on the telephone. She heard his voice. And that convinced her to seek out a medium who then started connecting with him. And he's just written a book with her, which will come out in September. I've just read the book. It's a fantastic uh, version of what's happening over there mm -hmm. and how these things work out. And in my book, It's a Wonderful Afterlife, Volume 2, 
The foreword was written by a guy named Galen Stoller, a young boy who died some years ago, and his father and I are friends. He also connected to his son and wrote a book called My Life After Death. Or no, My Life After Life. Eric's is My Life After Death. Sorry. Sorry. And both of them say the same things about the journey. Classrooms, about all, all these other things, these details. So I highly recommend, if you're interested in, you know, is it a simulation? Is it an illusion? Is it, what is it? It is what you make it to be. A simulation can be really fun if you're having fun. You see? It's up to you to decide to have the fun. And once you start to not take things so seriously, like, Whatever, whatever the news is, just mute it and watch the figures talk about stuff. <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> Those things are worthy of our examination, but now if you open your heart, your sacred heart, then you can see it from a different perspective. And I know that's our time. Thank you so much.